Katie's by Dana Lee. Chapter 9 The following morning the Tatties were eating porridge with nuts and berries for breakfast when Daddy insisted that Lazy Leaf Tatty be off early to work digging the wagon out of the mud. He set off with a shovel slung over his shoulder and Daddy directing, No dilly-dallying! Daddy then went off behind the spring house to have a pipe while Mummy washed the dirty linens. Sweet Tata, do you believe in fairies? I do, Fry. Tell me about her again. Well, I think I saw another one too, Tata. Only this one, she wore a tail. He stood up, pointing to his scrawny leg, showing her where the tail was in proportion to her body. She was real pretty, sparkly, pink and white. A mermaid, Sweet Tata was thrilled. Oh, Fry! Where did you see her? Right in Tatey Pond. But how, Fry? How can that be? I don't know. She just seemed to vanish into the water. Hmm. Maybe we could call her or lure her to us somehow. Sweet Tata was using her crafty little red head. How do you know about mermaids? Shh, I'm thinking. I went to school, you know. It was true, Sweet Tata had gone to school with other brownies, hedgehog, bumblebee, ladybug, and a lost gosling named Lucy. Old Madam Toadstool Tata taught their lessons and issued homework readings from little books written and bound by Tatys, Caterpillar, and bumblebees of old. They met each morning beneath a toadstool with thatching around three sides. Leaf Tatie did not go to school. Neither did his brother, the small fry. Leaf was too sleepy to get out of bed, and Fry Tatey was having too much fun playing in the hedge and dancing in the dew. This is why Sweet Tata knew all sorts of things that her brothers had never heard of. It was Lucy the Gosling who had told them a story about the mermaids. Then Sweet Tata got up from the breakfast table, went off to her little room, which was now filled with violets and lace, and brought her little flute that Grandpa Potato had given her, and her cherished blue plastic beads. We are going to try to lure her back, Fry Tatey. We'll wait till after supper, then we'll leave my blue beads at the edge of the pond on the stoop where we rest and hang our feet. I'll hide behind the rock and play something tempting. We'll see if she comes out. But when Mummy rang the bell for supper, Leaf Tatey could not be found. He's probably still working on the wagon, she hoped. But Sweet Tata knew he'd probably fallen asleep, and she and Harry went out looking for him. They found the little wagon still stuck in the mud, and Leaf Tatey was found covered with mud to his bony knees, sound asleep from exhaustion under a frond of fern. He had tried and tried to budge the broken wagon, but the mud had dried and claimed it. Little did the Tatys know, but there was now a family of puddle frogs who also called the wagon their own. Wake up, sleepyhead, sweet Tata said. Here, she removed the piece of rope that wound around her middle as a belt. We'll make a hitch to tie around Harry and pull it out. But Harry only kicked up mud, for the little belt was not long enough a hitch. It's no use. Come on, Leaf. You need a bath. We'll think of something. And they headed home and found Fry Tatey waiting at Tatey Pond. I couldn't wait. Sweet Tata pulled her blue beads from round her neck and dangled them before the small fry, before laying them with reverence and sacrifice upon the green stone. Pulling her little flute out from under her cap, she played something strange and sad, something like a combination of Music of the Night and Claire de Lune, which made the lazy leaf Tatey too sleepy for a bath, and he stumbled forward towards the house. He was, however, accosted by Mummy, somewhere between the front door and his bed. She soaked him in a tub of hot soapy water garnished with rose petals, scrubbed him clean with her long thistle brush before filling him full of stew and sending him off to bed. The crickets were chirping, and something was stirring in Tatey Pond. Sweet Tata played a hauntingly soft song, 
and Fry Tatey too had fallen asleep upon a warm tuft of moss when Sweet Tatey blinked and squinted her dazed eyes at the little head that she saw surfacing in the moonlight from the pond. Chapter 10 The mermaid had the beads draped across her little webbed fingers when Sweet Tatey ceased to play and inched forward, smiling with wonderment. Hello, she whispered. The little mermaid smiled too. Do you like my beads? Oh, yes, said the mermaid. You may have them. Oh, thank you, smiled the mermaid, and she wove the string of beads through a long plait in her hair. What's your name? I'm Sweet Tata. My friends call me Moon. Where do you come from? The mermaid seemed a bit puzzled by the question. I live beneath the pond. Oh, how did you get there? Oh, my friends dropped me here, for the musky and the kestrel of the lake kept trying to eat me. Eat you? Sweet Tata recalled One-Eyed Jack's story of the vicious big-eared cat. He had told her that the cat had wanted to eat him. Also, Daddy said to beware of the rotten raven. He'll eat you, he warned. The mermaid now lounged, leaning over the green stone edge delicate arms outstretched. Yes, the musky have sharp teeth, and the kestrel have wicked talons and beaks. They chased me day and night, but my friends, the loon, saved me and dropped me here. I even have a little house, she pointed, down below. Would you like to see? Oh, I'd love to, but I can't swim very well. I'll drown. Okay, said the mermaid, who was thinking that Sweet Tata must be another drowner when she asked, who are the loons? They're my closest friends. My best friend is a loon. Shh, listen, can you hear them? Then even the crickets got quiet and listened to the sad song of the loon. Your little flute seemed to echo them. That's why I came. Hold on. Before Sweet Tata could respond, the little mermaid was gone under with a splish splash. So she picked up and played her flute a melodic strain in tune to the harmony of the song of the loon. The little mermaid resurfaced her blue beaded head, and this time she had a little shell harp in her hands, which she had strung lovingly herself with strings she had pulled from waterweed. She plucked the lovely little harp and sang in tune, soft enough not to wake the sleeping small fry who was having the sweetest dream. The sweet lullaby seemed to lull Spring Hill into sleep and the purple sky itself blinked and closed its eyes to a dark blue. The mermaid then sang the song of the loon, but Sweet Tata did not understand the song, sad notes, or words. She did, however, recognize some of the song seemed to mimic the strange birds that haunted the lake at land's end. The nocturne ended with a low trill of the mermaid's tongue when all was silent and still. Sweet Tata hated to break the spell, but at last she feared that Moon might vanish again to the deep, so she asked quietly, The loon, are they the red-eyed birds that sound so sad with the speckled black and white feathers? They are sad. They call it keening sadness. They are the echo over the land. They have a oneness with the lake as long as they call it home. There is a heartbreaking beauty to their solitude. Sweet Tata did not understand this any better than the mermaid could ever fathom living beneath the roots of a pussy willow tree. But they did have Tatey Pond in common, and so did one of the strangest friends. I told you, my best friend is a loon who was blown here. She pointed down again to the water in a vicious storm as a duckling, lost from his family, I was here in this little grotto. Tatey Pond, Sweet Tata corrected, so they are just ducks. Well, not just any old ducks. They are the banshee of the lake, a very noble breed, like I am not just any old minnow. She splashed her beautiful little tail over and it glistened silver in the moonlight. Sweet Tata was delighted, as she always figured them to be some extraordinary species of bird herself. The very night seemed to shiver around the little mermaid, and Sweet Tata was lost in fascination. 
How are you lost from your family, if you don't mind me asking? Not at all, because I don't remember it at all. I remember being lost in the lake and being very small. I had to cling to the seaweed for dear life as the big fish and birds would try to eat me. Before that, I have but one washed away memory, she mused. I believe I was with my family. My daddy had caught a fish, a beautiful white trout. I told him, Daddy, let's not eat this. I don't believe we had tails. Anyways, that's all of it. A fish tail, but you know, I believe the fi that fish said, don't eat me. And that's all. The loon brought you here to the pond from the lake? Yes, I wrote in his mouth, she laughed. Weren't you afraid he'd eat you? The mermaid's little pearl teeth glistened and she laughed again. Well, to be honest, I was a little at first when we first met. That was Lazarus. My best friend is Lonely Loon, for she had been lost. I knew Lazarus from the lake prior to hitching a ride, but as I told you, they are noble birds. They eat bad little minnow who do not honor their mothers and stray off. Oh, they still rather frighten Sweet Tato. It's getting late, said the mermaid. Will I see you at the next full moon? Well, we'll probably be gone back home by then. We only spend the spring here if we are flooded out of our home under the pussy willow tree in Hedge Row. Summer is nearly upon us now, and we'll be getting back, well, if we can. We have to pack, and Daddy was hurt in a bad fall on the way here, and our wagon is wrecked, so I'm not sure if we can leave. Good, so you'll stay. We can't. Not for too long, as the place is buried under snow in the winter. The little mermaid knew that the pond was frozen over last winter, and she had to stay deep in her home beneath the earth and wall. I can help you get home. How? Well, since you are my friend, and in return for your lovely beads, she touched them, smiled, and shrugged her white shoulders. My friends will be happy to give you a lift. Who? Lonely and Lazarus. Oh no, Daddy would not allow it. Fiddle dee dee, said the mermaid. The loons are swift and careful. Lazarus flew me here before my tail dried up. Well, perhaps we could meet them first. I'll see. I'll call them in the morning and see if they can stop in for a visit tomorrow evening. Now I'm very sleepy, so good night. Nice to meet you, squeaked sweet Tata, and the mermaid disappeared under the deep. Chapter 11. The next morning, Mommy, Tata had a hard time waking her family for breakfast. Daddy's bones were aching. Sweet Tata had carried the small fry into bed, but he was still having sweet dreams which he did not wish to waken from. Leaf Tata did not want to get up and face the impossible task of fixing the broken wagon, and Sweet Tata was exhausted from the excitement of the next, the night before. As they sat down to their warm breakfast of porridge with berries, Sweet Tata informed them that they may be receiving gifts, guests for supper. What sort of vagabonds you be consorting with these days, Daddy Tatey grumbled. Oh, Daddy, all of our problems may be solved. You'll see. Sweet Tata gave her daddy a kiss on the forehead. He did see. They all saw, as two very beautiful wild loons swooped down upon Spring Hill as the evening fell all around them. Sweet Tata went out to greet them and found them to be rather shy, much more timid than One-Eyed Jack. The rest of the family stood within the doorway of Spring House, mouths gaping wide. Sweet Tata, you get back here, Daddy squealed. Sweet Tata stroked Lonely's lovely wing. Shh, you'll scare them. Lazarus turned his black hooded face towards her, and Sweet Tata saw the mystery within his sun-stained eyes, red as rubies. Moon was right. He had heartbroken eyes. Can we offer your family a lift back to Hedge Row? The loon whispered politely. Oh my! Oh yes, thank you. I have supper for you. Hold on, I'll be right back. Sweet Tata ran back to her frightened family. Oh, Mommy, get the moon cakes and fish pie for our new friends. They're named Lonely and Lazarus Loon. They're going to fly us home to Hedge Row. 
She ran into the kitchen, gathering the supper she had made in hopes of them coming, and they had. Mummy helped, and the whole family went out to meet them. The loons loved the fish pie, and Fry Tatey promised to catch a few minnows before going to bed for their breakfast. It was agreed that the loons would return the following morning to give them all a lift back to the pussy willow tree in Hedge Row. They all waved goodbye to the magnificent black and white creatures as they climbed into the night sky. As promised, the small fry went off to his favorite fishing hole. Usually he threw his fish back, but this time he brought his basket tied to his back and hurried back to Spring House where Mummy and Sweet Tata were finishing with the packing. Daddy cleaned the fish and Sweet Tata baked them in a pie before they all went off to sleep the last night at Spring House. Chapter 12 the next morning, Sweet Tata fed Harry Hedgehog a breakfast salad of flowers, kissed him, and waved him off to Hedgerow, promising that they'd see him, see him soon. Friday was in for another strange surprise, for when he opened his knapsack to check on Robert, a beautiful black and orange butterfly emerged and perched on his bed, fluttering its new wings. What have you done with Robert? The little Tatey cried. The butterfly giggled and whispered in a chiming voice. I am Robert, silly little Tatey. See you back at Hedge Row real soon. Then the little beast lifted off and flew out the window. Fry Tatey tried to stop him, but was left crying at the window ledge. He dried his tears, however, as he watched the silent descent of the loons. Come on, everybody, sweet Tata squeaked for she was very excited. First, she brought out the fresh fish pie and the hungry birds thanked her again for the vittles. Sweet Tata, Leaf Tatey, and Fry Tatey climbed on Lonely's back with their berries bundled into sacks. Mummy and Daddy, along with the rest of their packing, rode on Lazarus. They all waved goodbye to Spring House and took off for the ride of their lives. Yippee, Leaf squealed, while Daddy gripped Lazarus's neck for dear life. Sweet Tata watched as Spring Hill vanished into the morning mist. She took her flute from her pocket and played a sad song just for the loons. They liked it very much. She flew above the trees and through the clouds as they descended toward their own hill. It looked like a patchwork quilt of green created by Mother Nature herself. Fry Tatey waved to Robert who fluttered by. I've never even dreamt of such a thing, Daddy said. He was most appreciative, and upon landing at the base of the Pussy Willow, Daddy ordered garlands of buttercups and violets to be made and strung about the graceful necks of his esteemed guests. All of the Tatties gathered gut buttercups, daisies, violets, and Pussy Willow, which Mummy Tatty braided round in chains to hang upon the glossy necks of Lonely and Lazarus. The loons said that they must return to their lake and bade the Tatties farewell as they flew off overhead. Thank you, thank you, waved all the Tatties from the ground below. What beautiful birds, Mummy mused. Noble birds, Daddy said. <laughs>